hosting a, um, a gathering at Watson's Inc. in West Haven. And um, it was around how they've become more energy efficient and so on. So it was, uh, and I think Paul and Gavin have been working on that together or well, collaboration. Uh, and I remember walking into the boardroom and it, and it was like, it, it looked more like a, a borders sort of book department <laughs> than a boardroom. And, uh, and at that point, I, I kind of got that Gavin was an avid reader um, and he insisted that uh, as guests, we, we should take whatever books that we were drawn to. And there were, there were three titles that I, um, I accepted his offer and I read them and I, and I became really inspired uh, by them. So, um, and then, you know, we would have our monthly events at district and uh, Gavin would show up with basically a carload of books um, that he would continue to display um, at, at these uh, sort of live events that we had. So he, he's in my mind always been um, a, obviously a, a prolific reader, um, but he, he's also been very generous in, in sharing those um, those copies wherever he goes. So I see him as a bit of a, um, as a, as a um, Santa Claus in the book department, you know, so it's kind of appropriate that, that Gavin has taken up this, this sort of Friday reads as a, um, as a personal uh, part of his brand, because I know that it means so much to him and, and these sort of literary uh, assets that he's going to unpack with us today. So I'm really delighted that we can do this um, virtually because it's a good way to um, to exchange these ideas. So um, I think at this point, and I, and I will just, because uh, uh, Christy is on board, I will just take this opportunity to uh, welcome her on to the board um, to uh, of Conscious Capitalism uh, and, and join us in uh, making more of this trouble. So welcome, Christy. Thank you. I was very excited to receive your email this morning. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, it's it's going to be great to have you on board. Thank you. Happy to so, be on board. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's at this point, I, I probably just want to just hand it over to the boss, Gavin. He's he's um, made an outstanding effort to up his wardrobe going today. So <laughs> this is his new character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. So um, yeah, as Glenn was saying, you know, I just I love. I, for whatever reason, I love reading books about human psychology and groups and, and gr human behavior, human evolution, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, and um, so we were talking about this, you know, about this idea of doing this Friday read thing. And then so Eleanor and I set up a, a you know, phone Zoom call or whatever. And within the space of 45 minutes, we'd gone through these five books and just connected them all up together. And I have no idea actually how we actually managed to go exactly from one to the other, but we did. Um, and so we kind of put this together and said, okay, well, here's this thing. So, um, so we probably won't get to all five of them, but we'll get to at least two or three anyway and make some connections. Maybe we'll get to touch on five. But um, one of the reasons why I'm wearing this this hat and and this, this shirt today is uh, because um, within this last week or so, um, we lost uh, Tony Shea. Um, and I don't know if you guys know who Tony Shea, if all of you know, but basically, you know, he bought a little shoe company um, with some friends of his and ended up running it, ended up turning into Zappos. And um, so, and of course, and he wrote a book called Delivering Happiness, um, which I'm uh, now realizing it's like reverse, I think, on my screen. I don't know if that's the right way around or whatever. But anyhow, um, so it's cool. It's, it's a fun book. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so one of the, um, so some of their core values, one of them is having fun and a little weirdness. So um, this is my having fun and a little weirdness thing I'm doing. So um, with, the, with the hat and the, and the shirt and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, so maybe what I'll do is I got a, I, I put together some notes in a PowerPoint thing just to kind of help people to see stuff and be able to see the list and things as we kind of go through, but, you know, I don't want it to be all me talking and, that kind of thing. So if you want to you know, jump in or ask questions or, you know, whatever, um, that would be great. So two of the books that we we're, that we we're kind of going to talk about today were about um, um, human group interactions and, and um, what are the core principles that help groups to, to work together. Um, 
So, and just, you know, before we dive into that, I just wanted to share this about Tony Shea. So this is their Zappos core value. So delivering wow through service is one of my favorites. Um, embracing and driving change um, and then uh, creating fun and a little weirdness. I think that's, I think that's really cool. So part of where, you know, where this is really starting is, is um, this idea of the tragedy of the common. So, um, so the idea that, you know, if you have like a field or, or um, you know, a, a fishery or a forest or, or a certain set of water system, you know, water resources that, you know, if people left their own devices, you know, will people overgraze that, you know? So if you've got a, a common field in the middle of a, of, of a town um, and farmers are allowed to put their sheep there, will people put too many sheep there and graze it down to nothing and basically ruin it for everybody? Or will people overfish things? Um, so there was this woman, Eleanor Ostrom, and she won the Nobel Prize in economics for basically studying this um, and looking at the um, this tragedy of the commons kind of thing. And um, so what and what she found is that 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 wasn't necessarily the case that it would fall apart and and and, uh, you know, turn into a ruin that people it wasn't necessarily the case that things would be overfished, though, you know, sometimes um, that did happen. So one of the examples I'm I'm familiar with is up in up in Maine, there's a little island about 10 miles out farther than the island I go to called Matinicus and um, the lobster fishermen out there. Um, it's far enough away from the mainland and everything else that they basically it was just them fishing it and they um, had problems the lobster population was going down they weren't doing so well and so they got together and said look we got to do something about this let's limit the amount of traps we're doing let's limit the amount of time that we're lobstering let's bracket that and we'll see if we can get the lobster population to go back up um, so they did that and they were wildly successful the lobster population boomed out there um, and to the extent that um, lobstermen from the mainland and other islands started going out there um, and fishing it. Um, and so they um, basically went to the court system in Maine and said, look, you know, we've been taking care of this thing. It's, you know, historically been ours, you know, families and stuff through generations and whatever. And, and you know, we want to keep it that way. We can't have all these people coming out there and, and using it and, and depleting it because then it'll just be everybody that for themselves and we'll destroy it for everyone. And the court actually agreed. Um, and so basically deeded them the rights or whatever to, you know, a certain amount of area around their island that's, that's basically theirs to maintain. Um, so, so that kind of thing can work when you've got, you know, when you have the right, right setup. And then, and then, you know, the other thought I wanted to sort of express is that it's not just, you know, a common resource like fisheries or something. A company, you know, that people work in is a actually a shared commons. It's a thing that that group has um, that they take care of together. Um, and, you know, obviously the atmosphere is something that we all, um, we all take care of together. Um, and our democracy is another thing, uh, that we all enjoy, uh, having and that we all need to, you know, take care of. Um, otherwise it's going to mess it up, um, for everybody basically. So, so there were, um, about a year or so before Ellen Ostrom passed away, um, she met another guy. Uh, named David Sloan Wilson, who's an evolu evolutionary biologist. And uh, David Sloan Wilson wrote this book, um, Pro Social. And um, they got together and he realized that that basically what Eleanor Ostrom had come up with worked perfectly with the thing that he was working on called multi-level selection theory, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but um, so just sort of diverting momentarily that, you know, what what doesn't work are, th are basically total laissez-faire, people doing whatever they want. Like we, like we talked about, everybody coming out and overfishing something, chopping down all the trees in the forest, that kind of thing. That doesn't work. Um, the other thing that does, tends not to work really well is central control. Um, so it's just too slow. It's cumbersome. The, you know, central control is not really in touch with what's actually going on. Um, the environment, you know, tend to be too complex, uh, too much, you know, too many things happening, too much change. Um, central control systems don't work really well with that. It's also a possibility of, of corruption. If, if there's a, you know, group of officials who's in charge of a thing and, and, you know, taking bribes for it, that kind of thing that can, you know, for licenses and that sort of stuff. Um, the central control control system is, you know, basically taking and not contributing. And then it's also, you know, it's demotivating. If you're, you know, a lobsterman or you're a farmer or, you know, somebody, you know, who's taking care of a, a, a resource and some outside group that hardly ever shows up is all of a sudden, you know, telling you how to take care of it, um, that tends to get people pissed off. 
Um, so they got, they, you know, you end up having, you know, uh, people not not being helpful, not being cooperative, and and can cause cause trouble to the next. There we go. So so things that do work, um, basically um, these core design principles. So. Um, these are slightly different principles than what Eleanor Ostrom came up with because when David Sloan Wilson met her um, and they um, collaborated on, on it, they decided to upgrade them because all of her work was done on looking at what prevented um, a common resource from falling apart, um, from, you know, from getting overused. And you know, basically what um, uh, David Wilson um, said to her was, you, you know, not only do we want to avoid bad things happening, but you know, what if we could also create um, good things happening? So, um, for example, um, instead of just punishing bad behavior, what if we also rewarded or, or encouraged good behavior? Um, that kind of thing. So, um, so these are the the pro-social core design principles that they both came up with um, together. And they'll you can as you look as you kind of go through this, you'll see there's a lot of similarities with with conscious capitalism. So this is one of my things that I just keep I look at all these different things, these different perspectives, and I see over and over again, how the same sorts of things come up and the same um, types of things um, look like they work, you know, so somebody working at it from a different perspective, in this case, you know, an economist, um, Nobel Prize winning, winning economist and evolutionary biologist coming up with very similar things to what um, you know, John Mackey and, and Rasha Sodia came up with um, independently. Um, so um, the first thing that you need for, you know, for this to work for, you know, a common uh, resource um, to be taken care of and protected, whether it's a company or a field or a fishery, is shared identity and purpose. So those people have to know that they're a group. They have to be able to um, identify with each other, know who else is in the group, and they have to have a collective purpose. So the purpose might be maintaining that thing, or it could be some some other higher purpose in the case of a company. But they have to know they have to have a shared identity and shared and shared purpose. The next four things, um, sorry, the next five things I, I put in blue because they all kind of boil down to a fairness thing. So you know, equitable distribution and contributions and benefits fair and inclusive decision-making, monitoring agreed behavior. So there's gotta be some way to make sure that people are in fact doing what they say they're gonna do. They're not pulling in more fish than they're supposed to, that sort of thing. Um, graduated response to unhelpful behaviors and, and helpful behaviors. So if somebody is, has done something you know, nice and helpful for the group, it's nice to recognize them and, and encourage that. If somebody does something that's not helpful, um, it's their first time, then, you know, it should be a graduated response. So, you know, just a gentle reminder, hey, by the way, that's not a thing we do, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and that goes a long way. Actually, now that I'm just saying that I witnessed some, some of that behavior between a couple of lobstermen the summer, one was talking to the other guy, and it looked like I was overhearing this because I was on the shore and I thought that it was going to end up in a, in a fight. And the one guy stopped and actually said, okay, thank you. I needed that and and it was amazing. Um, but they basically they, you know, one guy said, look, John, I really care about you. And you know, what and they, but they were basically working out a thing. And so it was a gentle, you know, reminder of you know what sort of behavior was expected and, and that kind of thing. And the other the guy was was good with that. So um and then you know, if that doesn't work, obviously some sort of fast and fair sort of conflict resolution because when stuff drags on or was not getting resolved, that's not helpful. So, exact, so at this point, I just wanted to show a, a video about um, fairness because um, it's something, it's it's um, actually, you know, part of um, who we are. It's, it's uh, any questions or thoughts at the moment? Well, Gavin, it's Eleanor here. Um, sorry, you can't see me today, but I just wondered if uh, anybody in the group um, has has read anything by um, by Sloan Wilson or um, or Ostrom? Just be interesting to mm. get that baseline. If there's uh, any any shared, I've been I admit I've been uh, digging up essays and briefs of Ostrom's core design principles since you introduced me and. Um, Boy, does it seem useful! It seems like a really good foundational yeah. toolkit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, yeah, it's it's really it's definitely useful stuff. Um, so here's this. 
So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys. And I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Yeah, so so what's what's interesting about that is like he said, it works with dogs, it works with certain birds. Um so it works with with that experiment, works with creatures who who live in groups. So I expect it would work with elephants too. Um in and so basically, you know, it works with other primates like like chimpanzees um and bonobos. It doesn't work with orangutans, because orangutans are solitary creatures and they don't really care. Um, they don't, they're not wired that way to like get upset about something like that. And it works with crows because crows also live in groups. Um, so they care about each other. They care about what's happening, you know, who's getting what and everything. So they're just wired differently. And we're obviously, the reason why I wanted to show you that is because we're wired differently too, because we're very, very, very much group creatures. So all of those things that were in blue on, on, Austra you know, on that, on that list, those, those, those things that I put in blue, um, those are, are basically fairness things because we're hardwired for fairness. We, we really care uh, about that. So if you have you know, a couple of dogs in your house and you give one of them treats and you don't give the other one treats, you give one of them not so great treats or whatever like that, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll let you know that you're messing up. Um, so uh, um, anyway, so, it, so that was, that's some, you know, that's the first few of the, the core design principles. If I go ahead and, is it okay if I go ahead and share my screen again? and. And uh, I'll just note, Gavin, because you, you might not be able to see the chat, that um, Inga says that uh, she's familiar with Ostrom's work, and it's the basis for a global choices framework. Oh, cool. That, Sorry. So that would be interesting to, to hear from her about that at whatever point you want yeah. to. Yeah, cool. Sounds like an invitation to me, Inga, if you want to unmute yourself and tell us about the global choices framework. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, the Global Choices is, is the foundation that Sally, Rani and I um, founded. Um, and we were looking, we did a deep dive into really on strategy and particularly on climate strategy and mm. felt very strongly that what we are 
have moved to is an understanding that these climate systems are the massive interdependent systems that give us life. Um, and that these really were the global commons. They were no longer the, the proprietary um, property of just a few nations. Um, and in particular, we sort of doing a lot of modeling around the Arctic where the contiguous states are the governance states. And we are proposing that that governance that not mm -hmm. only for, for the Arctic, but for global commons generally, governance is incredibly impoverished and that we are now needing to look at what would global governance look like for global commons. And um, also how, how we take responsibility for these systems because it isn't just the purview of a few. Yeah, and yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, because we're all, yeah, we're all depending on, the, on those kinds of things, you know, the climate and the Arctic and, and all that affects, like the rainforest, it affects, it affects everybody, it's not just. Absolutely, you know. yeah. What a profound subject for, for modeling that and, and what a great example of the work, her, her work and the, uh, the writing really um, living inside your organization and oh absolutely <laughs> yeah very very much so and we were very inspired by it and and in a way sort of pushing it further um and trying to to use it as a as a basis for what we will need which is global governance going forward because we actually have so little um in the way of global governance you know we have the un but it doesn't have any teeth in terms of governance we have the G20, they have a particular focus. We have the G7s, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that's what we are missing. So yeah, that's what we're working on. And, and I think you have had some of our Arctic angels um, yes. speak at, at events, but yeah. I, won't, I won't take up any more time. I'm finding this very interesting because um, not only that, but the, the principles on which we are, have founded the organization, not only in terms of its work, but the way we work is very aligned with what you're, you're putting out um, as, as core principles. So thanks very much for that. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's terrific. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, so these, these things here are really based on, you know, are basically fairness issues. And I think to some extent, like if you go back and you look at, you know, looked at the um, uh, core values for Zappos, you see a lot of the things are very positive sorts of things. So, it, you know, I think that the, there's this, um, you know, the, to some extent, these things differ. The, the original um, core design principles that Eleanor Ostrom came up with, you know, were about preventing disasters, preventing things from going badly. Um, when you have a company, um, where people are largely cooperative and largely getting along, you, you might want to have more positive sorts of slants to some of these things um, than, uh, you know, more like the Zappos, um, you know, uh, values and that kind of stuff, because it's less likely that you're going to have to have issues. But it's good to have, you know, a framework for, or at least for, you know, for dealing with them. And and um, so anyway, we'll talk about some of the, some more stuff in a minute, but, um, I just want to mention like number seven, authority to self-govern, you know, whatever it is that your group is, um, you know, so if you're, um, you know, a bunch of fish, lobster fishermen in Maine, you need the authority to, to maintain that and govern that yourself and, and outside influences need to be able to, you know, stay away and leave you to some extent alone. Um, you know, that's going to be different on a, on a global level, but, on a, you know, when you're talking about a small group, that, that's the way you want to do it. Um, and then the other, the uh, principle number eight is really um, recognition that all this stuff is sort of fractal. So what's working on a small scale works in a, on a bigger scale or what doesn't work on a small scale doesn't work on a big scale. So um, you want to work, you know, so if you have a group of say five or six people that's working on a particular thing, um, and you, you know, you have a shared identity, you have a purpose, you've, you've got all the rest of these things on the list. Um, you probably have to work with and interact with other similar groups. Um, so the way you interact with those other groups is using the same, you know, first seven principles there um, to, to work with those, those other groups. And then, you know, so you end up having, um, you know, small, small, tiny groups and then, um, 
groups of groups and then maybe uh, turns into a company and then that company is actually in a um, in a system as part of a system with suppliers and customers and um, the community that it's in, the shareholders, the the um, and the overall environment. So there's there's all those other stakeholders, which are part, which are essentially other other groups that that company is is nested within. Um, so it's a very much a um, stakeholder uh, model, very similar to you know to conscious capitalism, and it you know it scales into larger and larger systems. But it you know the essential group system that we humans are good with working with is you know maybe. You know, five to seven individuals. We can kind of keep track of that many people, and how people are doing. And and you don't need much of a monitoring system if it's just you and you know five or six other people. Um, it's easy to keep track of who's doing what, and and if somebody needs help and that kind of thing. Um, versus you get to a bigger system, it gets a little bit more more difficult, um, a little bit more complicated. Um, so wanted to just just to talk a little bit about um, a couple of things. Um, so you know, Paul and I both played around quite a bit with with Lean, and then Scrum's another thing that I know Eleanor is very familiar with. Um, but these are sort of so Lean is is like a process improvement system that you can use in your company to make your your company better. Um, and the same thing, uh, and then Scrum is like a um, is a is usually a software development um, managed group. You know, project tool thing is what how some people would describe it, but um, both of these things are actually really similar. And when you look at when you know what Scrum and Lean are, and then you look back at the core design principles, it's like they're all aligned. So, for example, just using Scrum as a, as an example, um, in Scrum there's a, um, a uh, it's it's used usually for software development. So there's a list of things that need to be um, created, what the software needs to do. Um, there's a, a scrum team that gets together um, and um, to you know to basically do that work to do the software programming. And there's a so there's a person who basically maintains that list uh, of things that need to do in order of importance and and uh, what needs to get done first. The team though looks at that list, gets together at the beginning of what's called the sprint. So it's that um, period of time in which they're going to work. So they work in, in chunks of time, so maybe like two weeks uh, worth of time. So the team will get together, look at the list of, of the things on the chart that need to be done, figure out how many of those things they think that they can do in that two week period of time. Um, and that becomes their, their, um, their list for that two weeks. Then what the team does is the team uh, meets every morning um, talk about what they were doing the day before, what they're going to be doing the next day. It's very time constrained, 15 minute max uh, meeting. There's usually, um, you know, four to eight people or so on the team. Um, and they use a really simple system to figure out who's going to do what. So basically people just figure out what they want to do and who they're going to do it with. Um, and those those things on that list are usually just um, written on a post-it note, stuck on a board on one side of the board. And the people come up Take one of those things, they move it from the from the to-do list part of the board to the doing list part of the board. They start to work on that. They do that. When they get it done, they take it over and they put it on the done side of the board. Um, and you know, when and then they go back and look at the list again. And you know, if somebody needs help or whatever, they they flex around and, and do that. So um, it's a completely self-managing thing. Um, so the team is figuring out what they're gonna do, how much they're gonna do, you know, how much they think they can get done. Who's going to do it? Help each other out, and at the end, they have um, a presentation to the customer, um, a, you know, to show what functionality of with the software they've they've created, um, and then they also have what's called a team retrospective, where they have a, a team meeting for an hour or so um, and discuss, you know, what went well this sprint, what didn't go well this sprint, you know, what could we do better next time. Um, and that kind of thing. When you look at back at the core design principles, that's that's all of that stuff that's in blue, basically. You know, so we the team would actually get together before they even start and decide what their rules are and how you know how they're going to behave. Um, but this is you know it's a it's a system that that works that software engineers came up with um, totally independently. So um, this guy Jeff Sutherland wrote this book, um, Scrum: The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. He's one of the two people who developed. Um, Scrum initially, and it's it's like perfectly lined up with the core design principles. So there, you, you know, you have yet another instance of you know that these things work. And and you know, I know Paul's you know looked at that list and thinking about lean and and what works there. Um, so 
multi-level selection is one of the things that David Sloan Wilson um, was working on and, and put a lot of thought into. So, um, and I don't know if you've seen Margaret Hathfernan's um, Super Chicken um, TEDx video, but it's pretty funny, it's, re it's really good. But the idea was that, you know, if you wanted to get more eggs, you know, you could just take the chickens that were laying the most eggs and, and you know, breed them. And eventually you would end up with all of these chickens that were just breeding lots and lots, you know, making lots and lots of eggs. So they ran that experiment and it turned into a disaster. Those um, chickens were all attacking each other, plucking each other's feathers out and nobody was laying any eggs. Um, then they ran another experiment where they basically, you know, had groups, you know, a bunch of different groups of chickens and they bred the group of chickens that laid the most eggs. And what they ended up with was a bunch of very cooperative chickens that got along really well and all together ended up laying more eggs. Um, so, you know, cooperation or, and, and you know, selection at the group level is actually much more beneficial than, than you know, individual um, level selection. Um, it, there was another example with, um, with college students, they were given a, a questionnaire in their beginning of their freshman year to sort of assess how, um, how helpful or cooperative they were. Um, and um, then a, uh, about three months into that, they were given the questionnaire again and given a couple, two or three extra copies to give to some of their friends. And um, they filled those out and then they uh, played a game and, and the game you could win movie tickets and you could either play the game so that you won the movie tickets for yourself or you could play the game so that you could um, win movie tickets as a group. And so it turned out that the students who were the most, um, who, who uh, were the most cooperative um, there, they had also found friends who were also very cooperative and those groups performed really well and won themselves a lot of movie tickets. The students who um, were least cooperative and more self-interested um, got quite a few um, movie tickets for themselves, but their groups overall didn't perform very well. Um, so it's a, one of those things of, you know, the same things that make, you know, give you a bigger slice of pie aren't the same things that, that generate more pie. Um, so, you know, what's good for me, particularly if I was just concerned for, you know, myself isn't necessarily what's good for my group and, and that just escalates as you get to bigger and bigger groups. What's good for my smaller group isn't necessarily good for the bigger group and that sort of thing. Um, so, and then one of the things, so a lot, maybe I think like the last thing I'll just mention is that um, for human group evolution to work, you know, over over hundreds of thousands of years, um, when you have group level selection, what's really key and what's really important is group variation is variation within the group. So, so we have different personalities, um, different you know different skills, different ways of looking at the world, uh, including um, you know it's one of the other books we were going to talk about was the the Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. But um, you know, so one of the things he um, talks about is the difference in the way. Um, we tend to look at things, so politics or religion, morality, and that kind of thing. And what if if we're if our success depends on us as a group, then what we want is not a whole bunch of clones of people who are the same. What we want is a bunch of people who are different, um, because this, we'll see different things, we'll have different skills, different abilities, and that'll enhance our group performance and our group chance of success. So I think I'll I think I'll stop there. Um, Oh yeah. So and then so anyway, this is just you know, basically you're sort of reiterating what I said before about you know conscious capitalism companies do better because, um, you know, they basically right along the same lines as the the um, uh, you know core design principles and and uh, that sort of thing. So, um, so conscious companies are you know have a higher purpose. They know that they're a group. They know um, they have a conscious culture that contains those core design principles and. Um, they recognize that they're part of a, a system where all of the different companies together, um, you know, your suppliers, your customers, your community, everybody is all is all part of the same ball of wax. And, and you're kind of, you know, if, if any one of those parties takes more than their fair share, it's going to deplete the whole resource for the whole, for, for everyone. You're going to wrecking, you know, having a tragedy of the commons. And, you know, same thing happens in, in uh, all kinds of other places in life too, like the, um, the environment, the atmosphere, you know, our democracy and all of that. If one group tries to take more than their fair share um, and, you know, whatever is going to mess it up for 
mess it up for everybody. Um, fairness is key. Anyway, any? Interesting. Um, hey, this is so. Hey. This is Greg. Yeah. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Hi. Um, so one of the things that you know, as I I listen to your your presentation, is to think about how different that view is from how we often teach people. Like like I, I'm just like we so, so much of our effort, at least in universities and business schools, is teaching people how to think more narrowly about their own self-interest, which kind of goes against what you're describing as very counterproductive. Um, so, and it's changed the way in which I, I teach. So for instance, uh, sometimes when I teach either I'm teaching game theory or I'm teaching um, negotiation and we I use this little thing, you probably know about it, the, uh, the, the ultimatum game. Yeah, right? it's just the so ultimatum game, right, right. Right. right, right, right. And so so it's always, um, it's always why don't good. you describe it to people? Why, why don't sure. you describe it to the people there, and I'll, I'll tell you the problems that I run into. And that's not a problem; it's actually sort of a hopeful thing. Um, okay. Or maybe I'll do it. It's like right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You, you, go, know, you, go, you go. You go ahead. I've been talking too much anyway. You go ahead. Okay. So right. So the setup is is that you know I tell them I, you know we'll pretend that I come in and I have a, a bunch of money, a hundred dollars or whatever, and then there are these the two students or two people, and I say, well, one of you. I'm going to give you the opportunity and you're going to tell me how you'd like to divide this money right. with the other person. Um, and, uh, you know, you can take $99 or you can split it 50, 50 or however you want to split it. Um, but the, uh, but the thing is you have to make that as a proposal to the other person and the other person gets to either say yes or no. And if they say yes, then they accept the split of, of money. And if they say no, then neither of you get anything and I keep the money. So the first person has to propose and the second person either says yes or no. And, uh, you know, what people propose are some variation, you know, some people want to split it 50-50, some people split it 80-20 or whatever. Um, but that if I were to be teaching it as part of game theory or sometimes even as part of negotiation, I then have to spend a lot of effort explaining to them why rationally, self-interestedly, the first person should offer, keep, they'll say, I'll keep $99 and I'll give you $1. Okay. And the other person rationally is supposed to say, yes, I'll accept it because $1 is better than no, no dollars, no money, which is what I'll get if I turn it down. But right. of course, people are outraged at that and they're and people are willing to turn down you know again it's play money but you know the experimenters right. do it with you know yeah people are willing to turn down you know ten dollars or twenty dollars or right. even more than that out of a sense of feeling outrage right right that you and, know i'm and not punish, gonna, and and essentially in a way to punish the person who's not being fair Right. So, it's, is, you know, that that other, I will incur I, I will incur a significant I will incur a significant cost to myself in order to punish somebody who I think is being unfair. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And actually, so. Yeah. So, yeah. So. So um, there's a couple of places I want to go with that. So one of the things is the um, one of the key things is if it's if there's a finite number of rounds, there's much more mm -hmm. incentive to to not to be less fair. If if there if the number of rounds, of course you can't do infinite number of rounds in a classroom setting. But there, if the more infinite it is, the more likely it is that people will be um, will be fair. Um, right, and and we try to we try to you know kind of discuss it in the context of repeated games and prisoners' dilemmas, which we also go into. It's like you know, yeah. as long as you have a long enough horizon, you know, right. think of all of the opportunities for cooperation you'll lose out on by right. taking advantage of this person who now will want nothing to do with you. Um, right. But that what's interesting to me is that, it, is that so much effort sort of in training people or helping them think through is spent on pushing them so far into this self-calculating place right. only to then say, by the way, now that we've convinced you that you should not <laughs> follow your gut level sense of yeah. what's fair or whatever else, now we're gonna back our way into it. And it's the long way around the block and a lot right. of people, they only get halfway around the block. They get the yeah. message, oh yeah, I'm supposed to think about myself and, right. you know. Um, right, right, in the best and, interest of my company and, and cashing out on this deal right now and, and so what for everybody else, yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Well, so well, it gets me thinking about like, how do we teach people about business or how do we kind of, you know, develop people within businesses so that they have the, the sort of cleverness to see opportunities, but without having to like go through this path that's a dangerous path because it brings people into a really antisocial place before they can figure out how they justify it at the very end. Yeah, yeah. they justify their pro-social senses towards the very end. Anyway. Right, right. Well, what's, what's interesting is that a couple of things that, so, so th with those capuchin monkeys, if you keep going, the one who's mm -hmm. getting the grapes will actually refuse the grapes because, because mm. the, the one who's getting the grapes recognizes that what's happening is unfair and they will not cooperate with that. It takes a while, wow, there's... but they'll actually refuse to take the grapes. Um, so so wow. even the monkeys get it, um, which is, you know, one of those, so that's why, you know, primatology and, and, you know, things like that is so interesting because you can see little glimmers of ourselves in there and go like, oh, well, yeah, we are unique in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, some of this stuff is pretty hardwired. And especially, you know, if you see, you know, dogs and birds and other, you know, group social creatures acting the, acting the same way. There was another um, bunch of studies um, so you actually, we're going to go, we're going to hit the fifth book. So this book, Behave by Robert Sapolsky, um, somewhere around page 500 or so, he starts talking about um, uh, pro-social groups and behavior. And they ran that same experiment that you're talking about, the ultimatum game. They ran it with a whole bunch of different groups um, in different countries and, and um they ran, and, and one of the interesting things was is they, they ran it with the Hadza, which is, you know, an a, a, um, African tribal group that, that really doesn't, you know, hasn't had much, much contact with the, the rest of us. And, and um, so, you know, they live, they're hunter-gatherers, they live in a tight-knit community. And when they played the game with the Hadza, the, 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 um, the people were perfectly fine with only getting like a dollar out of the hundred, you know, in, the, in their case with the Hadza, they had, they played with honey because that was a, you know, valued, you know, prize thing, but the people were, were fine with only getting a tiny bit of honey. And, and so that was really stumping people. They're like, well, why, you know, why would, you know, especially in a close community, wouldn't you be pissed, you know, at that guy who only offered you, you know, a little smidgen of honey, you know, how would, how does that pan out? And you know what Robert Sapolsky basically theorizes is that in that kind of an instance, because they live together in a social group like that, that they're playing an infinite game. So it's not just right now, today. It's like, you know, that guy helped me out, you know, last week with this other thing. You know, this person's really good at hunting. That person's really good at making tools. This person knows where all the great herbal things are, you know, for, for when I'm feeling ill. And, and in the end, it kind of pans out. And so even though we're comparing total apples and complete oranges, you know, of all, all these different contributions, people are sort of are, are good with that. And then, you know, when, if there is somebody who's not pulling their load, who's not whatever, then the group will get together and, and talk to them about it and, you know, and or eventually boot them out um, because they're just, right. they're, they're not being, they're not being helpful. But um, so I thought right. that was kind of interesting observation of yeah. that, of that game versus in the U S we're much more, <laughs> much more likely to offer like close to 50%. Right. Right. Well, it makes me think, Makes it's it a, maybe so they're not so they're not this group that's doing it. they don't even do the calculation of relative magnitudes right. they're not in the calculating place because they have such you know kind of expectation that it will work out over the long haul and so right. i don't and even have to do that, that team, yeah and because they're going to live their entire lives with that with that group of people so like you know versus like if i was doing this with ali and i didn't think i was ever going to see ali again you know, we're just two random strangers somewhere in the U.S. And, you know, and, and then it'd be like, well, if I don't get it now, I'm never going to get it, you know, and never going to get my fair share. So, so I have to get it now versus if you're playing a long term game with a tighter knit group, you know, of, a, of you know, maybe, you know, stakeholders, you know, you know, a stakeholder system where you know who the other players are and you plan on doing this for a long time, then you know, then a little unfairness here and there, it's, it's okay, as long as eventually it doesn't, it's like, hey, wait a minute, you, you always take more, that's not fair, you know, and then, and then we'll get pissed off and we'll boot you out, but if, you know, if another, if a supplier, you know, little, or customer is a little one way or the other here and there, it's like, 
that's okay. We're all in it for the long term. We're all friends and, and we all get along, you know, that kind of thing. Does that help at all with with your with your question on like sweet? Yeah. No, it's it, yeah, yeah. It's it's it, it it's helpful and it also it makes me think of sort of David Graeber in his book on death, yeah. you know, saying that we in our culture, you know, he claims there are at least three different modes of making sense, right? You know, what he calls kind of primitive co communism or basic the thing of like, you know, sure you need something from me, I'll do it as a favor. You don't have to pay me back. Pay it forward. Right. Yeah. You, you do yeah. the same thing for me if the situation was reversed. And I'm not expecting that the situation ever will be reversed, but sort of within our in-group, we help each other. Then there's there's a, you know, sort of, you know, status. You know, I, I have high status because I give a lot. I throw the best parties. I spend a lot of money on this. It gives me social status. And then there's exchange. And But he, he says we, we always, at least in our culture, we always want to make everything an example of exchange. We always want to calculate. We always want to worry about that and that that's not the only mindset that humans bring to the situation. So anyway, yeah. that's, it's helpful. Yeah. Anyway, there's, there's, you know, lots of people on this call. I just, no, no, th yeah. th well, thanks it, for going off in this little tangent there. No, no, it's, it's good. Actually, you're just reminding me too that, so I was just yesterday, I was rereading, you know, flipping really quick through Tony Shea's book. And, you know, one of the things they do at Zappos is, you know, the wow, you know, it's, it's really important for them. And they were r ridiculously generous, you know, with, you know, giving customers all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, free shipping and, you know, spending time on the telephone, uh, you know, to, you know, connect them up with a good pizza place where they lived or something, you know, just in, insane stuff um, that they did. But definitely, you know, the whole, you know, random act of kindness, paying it forward, you know, wholehearted, generous giving. And I think that's a big part of why, you know, they have such a loyal following of, of you know, really excited customers and, and got so much good press is because, you know, they just did great things like that and not because they were doing it to get the glory. They just did it because it was who they were. Right, right. And that's always a fine thing of like, are you doing it because of, it's of, it's mm. of who you are as an yeah. individual or a company, or are you doing it because you're looking over your shoulder as it were, you know, see me doing this great thing, right? Yeah. It's good for press, it's good PR and, and people, you know, we're pretty, uh, we, we, we're concerned about whether somebody is doing it to look good or whether they're doing it quote unquote sincerely. I mean, you can't, I don't know if you can use that word with re regard to an organization, but, yeah. but organizations and people who seem like they're doing it quote unquote sincerely, people val value that even more. Right, 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 right. definitely. Yeah, you want to be part of that group and help them out and work with them and be involved. Yeah. So, Gavin, I'm going to need to go back to that video and see the uh, the happy ending, so to speak, with oh, a yeah. small primate. Well, it's not. One of them realizes yeah. that it's, that it's, enough is enough, and yeah, and, yeah. and it's ironic that that um, we should be switching our sort of learning um, mechanism back to small primates just to, to be right, reminded of the fact that we don't need to consume endless amounts of grapes um, while yeah. the, uh, the rest of our, our family suffer. So, it, but it is a good reminder of, of the obscene amounts of wealth in particularly in this country and the fact that it seems to be continuing without any um, resistance or, or, um, or such. Yeah, yeah, lack of lack of generosity or concern for lots yeah. of other people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah, that 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 whole thing of you know bigger pieces pie for me is instead of you know like you know how can we create pie you know more pie together and I you know that was one of the things that Tony Shea was was really trying to do you know after he sold Zappos to to um, Amazon is he was working on a working with a little experimental social community kind of thing in in um, in Las Vegas and trying to, you know, create living spaces and businesses and stuff with, you know, exciting, you know, dynamic um, energy and, and collaboration, cooperation kind of things, because that's, you know, that's the, you know, so we can, that's the other side of the thing, you know, that those core design principles are like, okay, yeah, let's avoid the tragedy, but, you know, also could we be thinking about how can we make this all better for everybody? Um, you know, what principles can we come up with to, to, to drive this forward and, and make it work? Anybody else have yeah, any? That's, yeah. That's Paul. Yeah. Um, uh, listening to it's a great, great conversation. Um, it, it sounds 
from the tragedy of the commons that it's a very fragile type of ecosystem at the end of the day, because if any of the um, inputs, you know, if there's an uncontrolled input, you know, if, if there's a fisherman out there who decides that he's not going to abide and you can't kick him out, um, you know, and, and then when you expand it to like uh, the climate or the global climate today, you know, you've got the, uh, the, the rainforest in, in Brazil that are just getting decimated in terms of uh, um, uh, conversion over to farmland and, and burn offs and things like that. And, you know, things happening where you really don't have the ability to control the inputs. It, it sounds like the smaller the ecosystem, the more likely it is to work so that you can establish that common purpose, establish where it has to matter to people. Yeah. Um, and the stronger that sort of a shared identity and purpose is, the more likely people are will be willing to um, reduce their uh, um, desire to maximize their own individual um, selfish, we'll call it, approach and be willing to um, try or, or buy into the collective good that, that can yield an even bigger um, a bigger yield at the yep. end of the day or provide a bigger yield because you're able to sustain the, uh, whether it's the lobby, the, the lobster right. beds or whatever it is. Right, the right. Thoughts. Yeah, it's definitely, a, it almost happens naturally with a small group. You know, you get a small startup company, you almost, it just, it just happens. You get, you know, a couple of friends, they found a, found a company, they hire a few more of their friends, whatever. And that dynamic is just there. Um, and then the, the trick is to recognize it and 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 then scale it. Um, and it is that is the the real trick. That's what you know David Sloan Wilson you know talks about a lot in his in his book is just how do you you know get that you know because you know you've got to go from this little tiny group of people to you know a larger group within a larger group and then you know it's a company and it's a group of companies and it's a state or it's a you know and it's a you know, a nation and, you know, all that kind of stuff and, and through all those layers. And we just have to become, you know, more conscious of all that. And one of the big problems has been this, this theory of, you know, of, you know, economics that, you know, was, was taught for so long, you know, that it's that selfish, you know, homo economicus, you know, doing it, you know, greed and, and selfishness that's going, that somehow, Going to create this great economy and make everything work and it's total bs but that's you know but that's sort of in every you know too many people's heads and they think that that's how it works and it's it's not and it and then when you go back and look at ourselves you know from a psychological point of view you know how we're designed and everything it's clearly not who we are we're not rational beings who do things entirely for ourselves you know we're 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 people we live in families we live in in groups we take care of each other all the time we rarely do we put our own self interest you know before the rest of the people in our in our group whatever that group is so naturally we don't do that but for some reason when we get to this corporate level it's sort of like well that's the expectation you know and and it's and part of it is you know you know some of these things that are happening now with ESG investing and stuff you know that's going to help but you know, that's the sort of thing is if, it, if we're just driving towards profits, if we're just trying to maximize that, then, then you know, we just build a big pile of fishing boats going out there. We're just going to pull every last one of them out and that'll be that, you know, we don't, we don't care, um, you know, but it's, so it's, it's that right. sustainability thing and everything that we're finally kind of getting around to, um, but it's, it's slow. It's going right. to be a lot of love. And, you know, right. for, a lot of, for a lot of groups, they have a hard time recognizing that they're part of a bigger piece. Thanks for dialing in and Greg, it's always good to hear from you. You've, um, you've, yeah. you're full of good questions. So you're, you're welcome um, again. Uh, it's time to wrap it up. We're at the top of the hour, but I just want to kind of give you guys heads up that uh, going into 2021, we uh, intend to uh, give Gavin a long runway here in terms of his uh, literary skills and, uh, and, and, and help us unpack the big picture in in so many good books to be read. Uh, so keep an eye on that for, Great. for next year. Um, next week, we have a very interesting fellow with the name of Michelle Nishan. He is the founder of Wholesome Wave. And, um, you know, one of the ironies in this country is that it's so wealthy, but it's, uh, it, it's also the home of these things called food deserts. 
And um, one of Michelle's, who happens to be a well-renowned chef, set up this nonprofit in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut, called Wholesome Wave. And next week he's going to be describing some of his uh, projects, one that he described where there was a grant for a $27 million uh, food distribution network in LA. So he's an interesting chap. And uh, it's funny as we go into the festive season where we, we, we are surrounded by um, plenty to eat, in some cases too much, that, that this will be a reminder that there are many that aren't so fortunate. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on this call here again next week um, with Michelle. And thanks again, Gavin. Love, I love hearing you talk with oh, such thanks. passion and, and, and enthusiasm around your uh, long, extensive book list. So thank you all for coming again this week. And uh, Inga, it's great to hear you dial in from so far away. And I'd love to explore more uh, about the Arctic Angels and uh, collaboration with you going forward. So thank you all for coming. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.